Thank you. I have the privilege of introducing our next two speakers. They've spent their respective careers building separately international reputations around addiction and drug dependency research and treatment methods. And to our great fortune, they've now chosen to make Roanoke and VTC their homes, where they collaborate together on this important work. I believe you will see the level of expertise and passion that each brings to this work as they give their remarks. Dr. Warren Bickle received his PhD in developmental and child psychology from the University of Kansas and his postdoc training at Johns Hopkins. After working at some other world-class facilities that I won't name, but they're in your book, he joined the Fralin Biomedical Research Institute of VTC in 2011, not long after Dr. Friedlander came here as its inaugural executive directors. Uh, great leaders attract great leaders. Here he serves as director of the Research Institute's Addiction Recovery Research Center and co-director of its Center for Transformative Research on Health Behaviors and has recently been awarded the well-deserved Virginia Tech Carilion Behavioral Health Research Endowed Professorship. He has many honors, but suffice it to say that Dr. Bickle is one of the world's leading innovators in the science of addiction. He has authored or co-authored numerous books, chapters, and papers. He has pioneered research into how the human brain incorporates the value of the future into decisions that many of us face about whether to engage in behaviors that, while they may seem great at the moment, are likely to have long-term disastrous consequences, such as drug taking or attending law school. <laughs> he has translated his research findings about substance abuse and addiction into a wider realm of health behaviors, including cancer survivors, and he has established the world's first registry to study the attributes of people who have successfully overcome addiction. Dr. Robert L. Tressman joined Carilion Clinic in April of 2017, where he serves as a senior vice president, professor, and chair of psychiatry for both Carilion Clinic and for the VTC School of Medicine. Dr. Tressman received his medical degree and his doctoral degree, his MD, PhD, from the University of Tennessee. He's nationally and internationally recognized as an expert in psychiatry and population health and has an extensive background in education and research. We are extraordinarily fortunate to have him here and at Carilion in particular. He too has authored or co-authored numerous books, chapters, and papers. He's a senior editor of the Oxford Textbook of Correctional Psychiatry. I haven't read that yet, but it's on my list. Co-author of the Correctional Mental Health Screen, one of two validated screening tools currently being used in Virginia's jails, and principal investigator and co-developer of a skills-based psychotherapy program known as Start Now, which is in use in over a dozen American correctional systems and multiple alternative to incarceration programs. Prior to joining Carillion, he was the physician executive responsible for all of healthcare in all of Connecticut's jails and prisons from 2007 until 2017. I believe Dr. Bickle will speak first but please join me in welcoming them both. Thank you, Nick, for uh, that wonderful introduction. And thank you all for being here and, and for your interest in this topic area. I've spent my adult life studying the problem of addiction. And I'd like to share with you some of the things I've learned. So I really think that we're in a tsunami of addiction problems. Here's the data from the, the CDC looking at uh, overdose deaths, right? Uh, you see the spike upwards? That's very challenging for us. More people died in 2017 from overdose than all the Americans who died in the 20 years of the Vietnam War. 
if you go to the wall in DC, you get a sense of the magnitude we're talking about. But that is trivial compared to the 480,000 Americans who die every year from tobacco, or the 80,000 Americans who die every year from alcoholism. We have an addiction problem. But the opioid one has caught our attention, and, and for good reason. Uh, from the CDC, we learned that increased 30% in 52 areas um, in 45 states, increased 70% in Midwestern region, and increased 54% uh, in large cities in 16 states. What's shocking about it is how it grabs people's behavior. They get high when they're shopping and leave their kid on, on you know, alone. They drop in on the streets when they're picking up their kids from school. Are you kidding me? This is a serious, serious problem. The NH says, addictions paralyze an ability to hijack key brain regions. The idea of the brain of, of drugs overtaking the brain is not new. If I can quote Shakespeare from the character Cassio in Othello, he says, how, it is, how is it that man takes into his mouth a thief that will steal his brain? Um, so I think we're facing a problem, and um, I think we need to think about things in a new way. Or as Abraham Lincoln said, the dogmas of the quiet past are inadequate to the stormy present. The occasion is piled high with difficulty, and we must rise with the occasion. As our case is new, so we must think anew and act anew. The thing that got me interested in the thing that I've been studying for uh, nearly 30 years now was when I was a postdoctoral fellow at Johns Hopkins, I was dealing with people that were opioid dependent, and if they tested positive for recent opioid use, I had to interact with them. I can't remember what I had to ask them or involve them with, but I do remember this one guy coming in. I'll call him Dennis. He rolls in. He has fresh track marks up and down his jugular, and he tested positive for heroin. I said, Dennis, what's going on? He said, haven't you read the papers? There's such pure heroin on the streets of Baltimore that people are overdosing. I had to try some. That was a long time ago. But today, anybody who's using any street drug knows there's a good chance they could overdose by doing it. But yet, we're still hearing about all these overdose deaths. What is going on? How can we understand this? Because this is a key part of understanding the addiction problem. Well, I think the solution um, was well summarized by um, Fiona Apple in her song, Criminal. I know tomorrow brings the consequence at hand, but I keep living this day like the next will never come. I think what um, Dennis and, and Fiona was telling us is that the time course of positive negative events um, have different meanings. So the chance to get a buzz, a really good buzz, right now, is worth anything that might happen downstream. Because I don't care about that. I only care about this. Well, I knew there was something about time. And it took us a while to figure out how to do it. And our first um, step in this direction was a very old test from like the 50s and 60s. But we, we used it because I knew we had to explore time. And we asked heroin-dependent people and control participants, community participants who are matched on age, gender, uh, gender, socioeconomic status, IQ, just to tell us about the future. And what we were concerned with was not their time, well, not the, the, the content, but what was the time frame? And here's the data. Uh, the control participants referred to a future of 4.7 years, or 1,715 days. Heroin addicts referred to a future on average of nine days. Nine days. That becomes an important um, lens by which to view the behavior of drug-dependent people. If you only worry about the next nine, uh, nine days, are you worried about sharing a needle that someone else just recently used? Any downstream negative consequence, such as HIV infection, nothing's going to happen in nine days. And you can think about the full range of all their behaviors in this context, and all of a sudden, it becomes clear how they're behaving. They're behaving with this short-term view. Um, now, we have very technically sophisticated ways of measuring this, and I'm not going to explain that to you because um, 
It's technical jargon. What you need to know is just this point. We measure this thing we call discounting of the future. We call it delay discounting. We call it immediate gratification. We call it a lot of different things. But this is what I'm going to be talking about, right? So what do we know about this? Well, um, if we think it's a candidate behavioral mark of the entire addiction process. It, in uh, longitudinal studies, it predicts who will later use substances if you do it, if you me measure this thing in uh, adolescence. Uh, degree of discounting is proportional to drug use. The more drugs you use, the more you discount the future. It can distinguish drug dependent people from controls or in recovery. Um, if you measure at the beginning of a clinical trial of behavior change, it's predictive of therapeutic success. My hunch is it could also probably be predictive in some judicial aesthetics. Um, and what we have been focusing on recently is how we can change it therapeutically, and I'm going to talk about that in a second. But I want to first uh, raise a couple of other points. First, um, we consider this a transease process. It cuts through across a lot of human problems. Um, Every form of addiction, except maybe marijuana dependence, demonstrates this. With marijuana dependence, we think it's a weaker effect, so you need a bigger end to observe it. And some studies are smaller ends, so you can't quite see that effect. If you're a problem gambler, you discount it more than if you're a non-problem gambler. If you're obese, you discount more than if you're not obese. If you're from a low socioeconomic status background, you discount more, more than if you're from a high. Um, a great study from the CDC with 1,000 individuals who are adolescents. Those that discount a lot engage in risky sexual behavior. Um, we, did a research, we did a research study with heroin-dependent people, and we broke them into two groups, the one that share needles and the ones that don't share needles. And the ones that share needles discount the future even more than I showed you there. Right? Um, that was shocking to me. I thought we'd have floor effects. Um, there's a whole range of health behaviors now that have been explored with discounting, and if you, if you discount a lot, you don't do any of those health behaviors. I won't read the list. It's a long one. My recent, uh, most recent study uh, that came out is if you, uh, people that text while driving discount more than people who do not text while driving. Um, I like to believe in symmetry of science, and there's actually problems also if you discount the future too little. Anorexia is a great example of that, right, where people can ignore the biological signals of starvation in order to achieve some future goal of how they might look. Um, so we've been talking about discounting as, as being evident in a wide number of different uh, disorders. That's what we call the trans disease. But recently, we've been exploring within the individual how much does discounting account for all their ch other choices. And we did this uh, first with smokers. We had 300 smokers. We got measured how much they discount the future. We just asked them about their health, their finances, all kinds of different things. And what we found was discounting predicted drug use. It predicted finances and household savings. If you discount a lot, you didn't have savings, and your household um, finances were a mess. Um, you didn't engage in fitness. You made poor, poor food choices. Uh, you had poor health, and you weren't engaged in personal development. In another study that was recently um, published in a journal of cancer, we looked at 1,000 cancer survivors, got the discounting, and then we asked them about their health behaviors, too. And the way to interpret this graph is this end is you're discounting a lot, this end you're discounting the future very little, or here you don't value the future, here you value the future, and if you don't value the future, uh, and these different numbers are the years in recovery from cancer treatment, three, seven, and 15 years, and what we see is as you disc if you discount the future a lot, you have higher alcohol consumption, you're smoking cigarettes, using other tobacco products, tanning, Really? Um, and you're not going to cancer screenings, of course. <laughs> so uh, we think what we've got here is a decision-based decision disorder. It fits very nicely with the neuroscience that's already been discussed. Um, and we need to come up with, a, 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 in my view, a new science of how to deal with that. Now, to be clear, as, as uh, Reed pointed out, we have a problem that we have to handle right now, and there are things that work right now. Um, and I have to tell you, if I had a loved one that was involved with the opioids, I would get them on methadone and buprenorphine in a second. And anybody that doesn't support get them getting on there, I think, is, has a problem with the facts and the data because it's overwhelming if you worry, worry about HIV infection or overdose deaths. 
We should get them on that drug before they even leave the jails, if you ask me, in my opinion, because I don't want to see people die. So what are we going to do about this? Well, given our recent observations, trying to add some new knowledge and new ways of intervening, um, we asked, started to ask the question, if many behaviors are the result of delayed discounting, then by changing discounting, could we change more than one behavior? Could we change a couple of behaviors? So um, this is really preliminary data. It's ongoing right now. I'm going to show you some, just some preliminary data, but I'm excited by it because it could be a game changer and open the door to some new um, types of doing things. So what we did is we took people with alcohol use disorder, and we got a baseline on them. We measured, we had them report in every day about their alcohol use. We gave them a, a remote BAL machine so we can measure their alcohol consumption in the real world. It takes a picture of their face every time they do it so we know who's who. And after we got that baseline, we had them come in and we had this do this new intervention. Now, uh, it, it, sometimes you think that, don't we know everything about human behavior? Well, shouldn't we know that by now? But we don't know a lot, right? And the new science of human prospection was declared as a science in a 2007 science paper. And from human the science of human prospection comes this interesting intervention called episodic future thinking. We ask people, Tell me something that may happen a week from now, uh, two weeks from now, a month from now, three months from now, six months from now. T for each one of those events, tell me who's going to be there, what are you going to see, hear, feel, smell, think. Give me a title for it. And by that simple manipulation, if we give them, show them the titles, we can get them to value the future more. So um, what we did is after getting the baseline of these alcohol use disorder individuals, we just texted them their episodic future titles three times a day. Obviously, not the most robust treatment, but one that could be easily transported. Um, so first, uh, if we look down here, this just means they got, we got them to, de de to value the future more and not discount as much. But we are able to get them uh, to decrease the number of drinks by about uh, th th three or four per day just by texting them these episodic future events. Now here's the exciting part of this. Some of these people are smokers. And one way we measure how much people value these two commodities is we do a, a demand curve. We essentially say, how many uh, drinks would you have or how many cigarettes would you have for your consumption over 24 hours if, you were, if, we, if it was uh, solely for you, you couldn't save any, you couldn't give any away at these different prices. So they're, you know, they're showing price sensitivity. So uh, what we found is that pre to post for the group that got the episodic future thinking, we decreased how much they value alcohol. The control group did not change at all. For the, the group, for a, the portion of these people that were also cigarette smokers, we showed a concomitant decrease in cigarette smoking. Even though, you know, they weren't there because they had a, a smoke, they weren't worried about their cigarette smoking problem, right? We got, but we got them to open the future, and that changed how they dealt with that commodity. So I'm hoping that we're going to start learn, we're going to learn a lot about addiction, and with that, we're going to rethink how we do things. And I think uh, T.S. Eliot sums it up very nicely. We shall not cease from exploration, and the end of all our exploring will be to arrive where we started and know the place for the first time. Thank you very much. Questions for Dr. Bickle? <laughs> There you go. Please stand what, up. What other treatments might affect this uh, future thing or getting people to pick sure. up? Sure. So um, uh, based on some prior work I was involved with, if you give people a highly intensive uh, multi-component treatment, you can also get some changes in this. So if, for example, you give people Suboxone and you give them good cognitive behavior therapy and you give them incentives for absence, you can also get changes in discounting as well as uh, changes in drug use. Yep. What is the jail? Stand up, please. There's a microphone. What is the jail? Oh, excuse me. Do you use the suboxone? Prescribed. 
I'm sorry. Did you repeat? I'm sorry. The data on the individuals that are prescribed Suboxone or Methadone yes. and the rate of abuse. Beautiful. So there was a great study that came out of, uh, out of England. It had everyone on medication for like uh, 30 days. One group they continued and the other group they just dis discontinued, right? And, at the, uh, and all the ones that discontinued relapsed to, to heroin use and a certain number of them died, right? We could also look at H the, the HIV infection for people that go off, right? The, the numbers go up. So um, I think about harm reduction myself, right? I, I, I'd like to see less harm in the world. Um, and we have some pathways that allow us to, to allow people to less likely to harm themselves and perhaps others. Um, there was some data from a beautiful methadone treatment uh, program from like uh, the 90s. Uh, it was a great little book about a summary of methadone treatment, and it looked at seven methadone clinics, seven methadone clinics in the, in the um, northeast, and found out what was the number of instances of crime, days of crime, that happened for those addicts prior to treatment, and how many once they were in treatment. While they're where they're not in treatment, there were 300 days of crime per year, not instances of crime, days of crime because I've dealt with heroin dependent people that need to come up with $5,000 a week and didn't have a job. Well, how are you gonna do that? <laughs> right, you gotta, it's, it's a very demanding lifestyle, right? Uh, once they get into methadone treatment, it drops to 20, 320. Um, so I think um, if a careful assessment of a broad range of data at multiple levels of analysis would suggest there's benefit for providing uh, those sorts of treatments whenever it's possible. Okay, no more questions. Thank you, Dr. Bickle. Sure. And uh, next we have uh, Dr. Robert Tressman from Brilliant. Bob. So, good afternoon, everyone. Um, this is a fascinating and challenging time for us all. If we had no issue with money, life would be a lot simpler for a lot of us, certainly as we're making decisions. Thank you. And so one of the challenges we have is how do we provide appropriate decision making? How do we provide resources? Additionally, one of the things I'd like to mention, even though it only applies to a subsample, uh, I think for most of the JDs in the room, you'll know the answer to this. Who which of us as Americans have a constitutional right to health care? Oh, please. Thank you. Better? Do you mean a real right or a made up judgment? No. I, <laughs> who has a constitutional right? to health care in this country. And let me give you a hint. 1973, Estelle v. Gamble. Anyone incarcerated has a constitutional right to health care. And that was repeatedly elaborated upon in the circuits as well as in the Supreme Court time and time again. Um, and so, to be clear, for today's purposes, I have no conflicts of interest. This may not re be resonant for the CLEs. It is for CMEs, so it's a habit. Forgive me. Um, hmm. Ah. OK, thank you. Um, so one of the things I really do want to be clear about in terms of treatment and this applies across all issues of health and health care. Prevention is far better, far more effective, both in terms of our society as well as health care costs, than anything we do in terms of treatment. That said, can we treat addiction? And the short answer is yes, we can. And when you look at if someone is able to be treated with state-of-the-art care, the quality of the outcome is about the same as it is for any chronic medical condition. The outcome for addiction treatment 
when delivered with the same quality of care as we might for hypertension or diabetes is about the same as it is for addiction. The challenge for us is we have woefully inadequate resources and similar to the issues that we deal with with precedence and common law, we have a long history and we have lots of habits. This was a publication that came out earlier this year uh, through the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Agency. It was a consensus document from the Department of Justice, including the Bureau of Justice Assistance, the Federal BOP, the National Association of Counties, the, uh, the, the CSG, the Council of State Governments, as well as representatives from the Fairfax, Virginia Sheriff's Office and Community Service Board. This has relevance locally. And so I, the data that I want to present is either directly derived from this or from referenced materials. Evidence-based programs and practices in behavioral health treatment services should be used to provide high quality clinical care for justice involved individuals. So should is always a tricky term, but it is nevertheless a critical one. So what does that kind of care ideally mean? It means that we need to think about broad terminology. We need to also think about criminal thinking. We need to be able to change the way people think about their behavior. We can do this through cognitive behavioral and other kinds of skills-based training that will focus on judgment and on criminal behavior and that the treatment should be tailored to the individual. One size does not fit all people. We need to look at motivation, problem solving, skill building to improve their cognitive, social, emotional, and coping skills, and assist in building pro-social supports and activities. As any parent knows, simply saying no to a child doesn't work really well, at least not for long, right? It's important to provide alternatives. It's important to provide the skills, the habits, the behaviors that can lead to the outcomes we want. So we need to integrate treatment for co-occurring mental illness and substance use disorders because sadly they all too frequently, as many of you in this room know, all too often will coexist. And we need to evaluate. We can't just deliver services and not look at the outcomes. We have to be critical. We must look at the data. We have to invest in the resources needed to evaluate what we do. Otherwise, how would we know if we're doing well? So talking for a minute, criminogenic risk. This is something that's come out of a lot of work um, over the years, uh, particularly from the Council of State Governments and uh, from other organizations working with the Bureau of Justice Assistance. Criminogenic risk and need factors. Criminogenic risk is the likelihood that someone will engage in future illegal behavior. What's the risk? Then what are the need factors? These are the things we can modulate. These are the things we can change. These include not having a job, having livable wages, having safe housing in a pro-social setting, the presence of a substance use disorder. All of these, in theory, are changeable. Part of what we've learned in medicine broadly is that the social determinants of health outweigh what we can do as physicians. Similarly, we need to take into account the social determinants that contribute to someone's inability to stay law-abiding once they have been released from jail or prison or are now justice involved. Research indicates that behavioral health treatment alone will not necessarily reduce recidivism and conversely that our interventions that address only criminogenic risk and needs factors may not improve behavioral health outcomes. We need to think broadly. As we're talking about data, let me be clear about some terms. You may have heard frequently used terms like evidence-based decision-making, evidence-based practice. Well, 20 plus years ago, this was defined 
at least in medicine, as conscientious and explicit use of current best evidence in making decisions about care for the individual and integrating the best available clinical expertise from individuals, integrating that with research and published data using clinical evidence from systematic research. A lower down notch from evidence-based is something called promising practices. Those that don't currently have the research evidence to support them, but have at least some data that suggests that they may be of benefit. And so from this consensus document, from all of these agencies published just a few months ago, earlier this year, what were they finding? What are evidence-based treatments for substance use disorders for individuals who are now justice involved? There's a whole series of them. Not any one tool. Think you know, that we should have something more sophisticated than only a sledgehammer. We need more fine-grained tools in helping to change people's lives. Cognitive behavioral therapy is something very, very different than the Freudian psychoanalysis of 100 years ago. This is very outcomes-based, as Dr. Bickle had mentioned, focusing on problem solving that results from dysfunctional thoughts, moods, behaviors. It is targeted, structured, frequently counseling. It's very guided, outcomes-based. It helps individuals to address problematic behaviors, and it helps them to develop the skills they need and the coping strategies to stop substance abuse and address other co-occurring issues. When you hear about uh, therapy, this is one of the core elements when, from the scientific perspective, from evidence-based data, we're talking about cognitive behavioral therapy. Motivational interviewing developed over the last 25 years, initially focusing on exactly these populations. Motivational interviewing is a core element in virtually every therapist's arsenal today. It is a person-centered style of counseling that helps to engage people where they are now and incrementally overcoming the different resistances they have and building on their ability to engage in treatment and working incrementally to overcome ambivalence. This is manualized, it's teachable, and it's a really important element. And when you combine motivational interviewing and cognitive behavioral therapy, you have a very powerful tool that requires training and supervision of the clinicians who are providing it. Contingency management is an, is an approach that has been developed by people who have worked with Dr. Bickle over the years. Nancy Petrie is one of those champions of contingency management, and this is one of the elements that has proven time and again to be of value, even though it runs counter to a lot of our cherished long-held beliefs that we shouldn't punish, that we shouldn't um, reward bad behavior. Contingency management is using an intervention to reinforce incrementally good behaviors. So we would reinforce by giving some type of a reward. Sometimes it's literally a gold star on a piece of paper. Sometimes it's money. It can be many different things. But rewarding days of commitment to abstinence or reducing the amount of drug use through harm reduction. And so by different kinds of vouchers or all sorts of approaches, as well as potential negative consequences, indeed, can be part of this. Increased supervision, for example. But contingency management is an evidence-based approach to the treatment of substance use disorder. And notice I have gone through at least three different initiatives that are th therapies, psychotherapies, not directly related to medication. I'm only now talking about medication-assisted therapy. And why? Read the words carefully. Medication to assist the therapy. 
And that's really a very important con concept for us. Here's one of the challenges that many, many people in the field genuinely and firmly believe. Why in the world would I give another drug to a drug addict? Right? And so what we have learned in this context is that what we are doing is not replacing one drug of abuse with another. What we are doing is treating a medical condition with a medication. A medication that either saturates the brain's opioid receptors so that taking other drugs are not going to give a person a high and will also reduce craving and will reduce all of the associated behaviors. It will also block withdrawal, which leads to a, a term that we've heard frequently these days, dope sickness. And so medication-assisted therapy, when done well with appropriate supervision, has been found to lead to some of the best maintained outcomes in terms of interventions. Now, I'll go into the details of that in just a minute. I want to mention, remember, there was a notch below evidence-based treatments. Those are promising programs. 12-step and mutual aid programs, abstinence programs, uh, are at that level. To this day, at least according to published research that I've been able to find, there have been four published research studies looking at Alcoholics Anonymous that meet formal standards for reliability in the way they were done. Two of them showed benefit, one showed no benefit, and one showed inconclusive results. And there's even less data on Narcotics Anonymous. So we don't have the data to make a decision, although clearly for some people, it works. It does work. One of the challenges that we all have to face, and we have a joint opportunity to participate in, is to figure out which treatments work for which people in which settings, and at what point on their journey through life. And by working collaboratively, science, medicine, and law, we can advance substantially by working in a collaborative fashion and collecting and analyzing the data. Peer-based recovery support programs have also evolved over the last 20 years. Formerly justice-involved individuals who are in recovery and can provide support to others who are involved. This is an evolving field. It's got a lot of substantive value and face validity, we are still working to gather data to make this an evidence-based approach. What are the medications that are being used now in medication-assisted therapy? There are really three. And there are different you know, names and different variations on the theme, clearly. But the two medications that are used most commonly, methadone, been around a long time, um, Arguably, it is the gold standard. Buprenorphine, you know, and you may hear the term suboxone or subutex. That is a buprenorphine a series of products. Both have been shown consistently and reliably in combination with appropriate psychotherapy to reduce opioid use and related symptoms to definitely reduce the risk of infectious disease transmission. And for those of us who lived through the HIV epidemic of the 80s and 90s, and I was a physician in New York City then, so I lived through that, that's going to pale to the hepatitis C epidemic we're going to be facing in the years ahead unless we grapple with this now. And criminal behavior associated with drug use. These medications work by controlling withdrawal symptoms, and they reduce the cravings for the drug. They do not give people a high when medicated appropriately and managed appropriately. And they increase treatment retention, which is consistently found to be associated with beneficial outcomes. There is also now Trexone, whether orally or in injected forms. 
it is an antagonist. It simply blocks the effect of all opioids. It can be effective for rel uh, relapse prevention in patients who have already been stably detoxed from opioids. It is currently being used in three pilot programs in the Commonwealth of Virginia in jails prior to release, which is a wonderful advancement of where we were. My own personal opinion based on my reading and my experience of over 20 years being a physician with those who are justice involved is it is consistently less effective. Uh, in the justice-involved population compared to buprenorphine or methadone in preventing recidivism or relapse. But I'm delighted to be proven wrong with future data if we are able to effectively evaluate and collect that. What we know is that using evidence-based practice, when we implement it with fidelity, that's a key word here, are associated with Enhanced treatment retention, reduced recidivism, defined as rearrest or reincarceration, and reduced cost. It's far cheaper to treat someone and manage them in the community than it is to incarcerate. So there are many, many opportunities to do this. When I mention the word fidelity, in a medical situation that means if an evidence-based program was developed, there were certain structures, certain frequencies of use, and appropriate oversight. If you simply turn something loose into the field with inadequate resource and inadequate supervision, then it's going to drift. It does. And the results will, in a comparable way, drift. And they will, given entropy, it's not going to drift in a good direction. It's going to drift down. So it's really important that when we do things, we need to build them for sustainability and for accountability. We need to be as accountable as we want the people who become justice involved to be accountable as well. A specific subset of people that was mentioned earlier as well, those who are transitioning from incarceration, something that was published late last year, uh, both by the sheriff's uh, organization, the National Sheriff's uh, Association as well as the National Commission on Correctional Health Care jointly published this. Um, and the data is really very, very clear. There is a, in the two weeks after release from a correctional institution, there is a 12-fold higher risk of death to those individuals compared to others. And the risk of fatal overdose is profoundly elevated in this time, and it's a leading contributor. The demonstrated benefits of incorporating medication-assisted therapy, again, medication coupled with evidence-based psychotherapy, into criminal justice treatment programs during incarceration and continuing post-incarceration is to reduce post-release opioid use, hasten treatment engagement. A warm handoff is critical. When someone is given a, an appointment two weeks after they're discharged and are supposed to go cold to meet someone that they've never met before uh, to engage in treatment, the chances of that succeeding are pretty modest at best. The data clearly reflects that people will be in treatment longer, and it will reduce all-cause and overdose mortality rates after release, as well as reducing the rates of rearrest and reincarceration or of remand if they are in supervision in community corrections post-release. So what I've hoped to do in this very brief, once over the top, lightly discussion, consistent with everyone else's, is to at least give a sense of the scope of the opportunities to challenge some beliefs and to ask each of us to think about looking at the data that drives what we believe because we've all been taught things that we have not reassessed in recent years in the light of new data. Some of what we were taught is still spot on correct. Some of it may no longer be. And if we believe that we need to do something for which we don't have adequate resources, then it's incumbent on all of us to find ways to get the resources we need to do what we know is right 
for the people who come before us, either as a physician, as a judge, as a probation officer. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bob. <clears throat> we have time for <clears throat> a couple questions for Dr. Tressman. Yes, would somebody bring a microphone down? <clears throat> Thank you, Jed. Thank you for that presentation. Um, I have two questions. One is, um, what are your thoughts on introducing buprenorphine to somebody who's been abstinent? So somebody maybe that's coming out of a correctional facility versus a jail. Um, the second question I have is, um, you talked about naltrexone being um, consistently ineffective, or not, not ineffective, but perhaps um, a not as effective for justice-involved um, population. And is that for those, does that account for those that are in jail or for the correctional facilities? So for those, thank you. Um, one of the issues, particularly in a correctional setting, when people have been uh, coercively abstinent, um, the challenge is helping them to stay abstinent on release. And as we know, the success rate of that simply by being abstinent and people saying, oh, I'm good, I haven't had anything for six months or a year, the chances they're going to stay sober and not going back to drugs on release is near zero. And so it is important to be able to develop programs, and there are pilot programs and system-wide programs around the nation in large jail systems, uh, Hamden County in Massachusetts being one of the classics, as well as in Rikers Island in New York, where we start people on medication-assisted therapy prior to release, get them stable. Uh, there are other programs we had done even in Connecticut, where if someone was on buprenorphine uh, when they were uh, incarcerated, if it was a short stay, we kept them on it and turned them back to their providers and kept it consistent. And so yes, that is something of real relevance. There are ways in which you can keep diversion from happening. Diversion and uh, the integrate, uh, we would be rather naive to think that drugs don't get into our jails and prisons right now. But by having appropriate structures in place, we are able to minimize that and to supervise it so that diversion occurs minimally or not at all. In terms of the use of naltrexone, it is a reasonable start. It definitely is. It is absolutely much better than not providing something. No question. It's a question of relative benefit that naltrexone or methadone appropriately administered and supervised will, in a justice-involved population, consistently lead to longer retention in treatment and lower reincarceration rates in the future. So that's why I would work and advocate for that rather than naltrexone, but naltrexone is a great start. Thank you. Other questions? Seems, uh, okay, one right, right there. Yes, please stand up. I've got my table up, so if I can't, don't want to stand. But when you use methadone for treatment and the uh, addict uh, uses again, what kind of statistics do you have on overdose deaths in that situation for methadone? Because it has a long half-life. Yeah. Uh, methadone, anyone can overdose on top of anything else. Enough drug in your body will kill you. So, uh, but methadone having been used for about 40 plus years now, has a demonstrated safety record that's rather remarkable. It really is. Keep in mind, as a physician, I can write a prescription for cancer treatment today. I'm a psychiatrist. No one is going to stop me from writing it. It's legal for me to do it. Stupid, but it's legal. And those drugs are far more dangerous than either now trexone or methadone. And yet because of the stigma of opioid addiction, we've created unnecessary regulation that makes it difficult for us, unnecessarily difficult for us to treat people. Next question, right here. Hi, I was just wondering why you would recommend methadone 
sub the suboxone when they are both addictive too? Um, and thank you for that question. It is something that raises many, many issues for many people uh, about the potential addictive quality of the drug treatment. The, as people have been, you know, whether it was Dr. Shen or Dr. Montague, Dr. Bickle, this is not a moral failing. This is a brain disease. Because it's a brain disease, there are multiple ways in which we can address it. And as with the individual treatment of any patient or client, we have to think through how severe is the condition. There are some people for whom the condition or their own genetics makes it easier for them to manage and indeed to succeed through abstinence only. There are others who will never be able to do so through abstinence only approaches. These drugs, it, it, it's so much like Diabetes, it honestly is. There are some people who have diabetes because they're overweight. They develop it as an adult. If they lose the excess weight, they may no longer be diabetic. And that was through behavioral change only. There are others of us who are born with a genetic risk that no matter what you do as a child, you are diabetic. <coughs> Insulin will allow them to lead a normal life. It makes no sense to me to think about, well, their blood sugars are fine, they're doing well, they've been on it for two years, I'm gonna stop the insulin. It's exactly, for some people, the same biology as it would be for a heroin addiction. So, and each drug is different. Alcohol, no, that's a, I, I'm not talking about giving people Jack Daniels for, for alcoholism, no. But opioids are a profoundly integrated part of our brain and make it really difficult for some, biologically, to overcome only by behavior. But we can work to change the brain through behavior and through medication. When we use both together, we can really succeed well. <clears throat> what we don't know, I'm sorry, just to, what we don't know is which person needs to be on it for their lives, which person only needs to be on it for two years, which person six months, and which person never. It's really hard up front to know, we don't have the data yet, to know with certainty who is going to benefit from which. We still need to learn that. But if we want to keep our population in the community safe, and if we want to keep just as involved individuals from being reincarcerated, treat with medication and psychotherapy. Question in the back. Hey, Dr. Tressman, uh, Tom Bauer, Salem Commonwealth Attorney, and he and I have done several uh, TV yes, shows together. I think part of the problem from prosecutors is that over the years, and, and you hear it from the vice officers as well, is you get people on Suboxone with no end game at all, or methadone. And of course, then the other part of it is, if you don't control the pill dis distribution, then they become, they sell the, the methadone and the suboxone on the side. So then you're creating a uh, insurance funded drug dealer who's getting treatment and has, and has no end game. So I guess what, what frustrates me, and, and you and I, we agree on a lot and we disagree on a little bit, but where, I don't hear much about the end game. And I know you can't say, well, everybody can get off it in five years. But I don't hear much, I hear more about here's how we need to start, but I don't hear of an end game of how to get people off of a drug, and that kind of circles back around to why are you place, replacing one drug with another. Thank you. Good seeing you. So, um, one of the opportunities is, and this goes back to fidelity of the program. Virginia has been wonderful in developing the Addiction Recovery and Treatment Services Program, the ARTS program. Part of that is close treatment and monitoring of treatment. For the time that an individual is under community supervision, we have the opportunity to monitor them closely. We can monitor and test for not only whether they're taking the uh, either methadone or suboxone, 
but we can test quantitatively. We can see if there are other elements there. When we do that well, we can know whether they are adherent. We can also, depending upon the level of supervision necessary, know whether they are breaking the law or not. If, in the best of outcomes, they are staying with the program, at the end of the court-mandated period, then what happens? They would either, you know, so they're no longer just as supervised, they may be able now to choose under Medicaid to continue treatment, and in any appropriate treatment modality, they should be consistently and appropriately tested to be sure they're taking it, and that they should be tested every so often to see if they can be tapered off safely. And that's something that we can do. But I agree with you, it's not done often enough. In a supervised manner, we should be working to taper people off and to test whether they're going to succeed or not. And if they're going to fail, to reinstitute and then check again. This is an element that is missing, and I firmly support the need to do that. Thank you. For one last question, I think. Was there one back there? Somewhere in the back. All right, back there. Go ahead. <coughs> Dr. Tressman Fidel Valea from OBGYN, why not consider this a chronic disease? And a hypertensive, you put them on hypertension medication, they're pretty much on it for life unless they make life modifications that they can come off it. A diabetic, same thing. Why are we treating this any differently? Why do we have to take them off? And this is an issue for data. And what we don't know, we know if we use, and this has been proven for 25 years, someone who suffers with a severe form of obsessive compulsive disorder. We can treat them with medication or we can treat them with psychotherapy. We can look at their brain scans before and we can look after. Whether you use psychotherapy or psychopharmacology, if they've been successfully treated, the changes in the brain are identical, whether you've used psychotherapy or medication. With this population, if we are successful in, in, in psychotherapeutic interventions, then we may be able to see changes in the brain that would reflect that. So the, the question is, and what we've seen is not everyone, clearly, because there are people who go through abstinence-only therapy who can stay abstinent for the rest of their lives. But most will acknowledge, I'm one hit away from being an addict again. And so the challenge is how do we learn more? How do we develop the data to be able to make these precision decisions for each individual? Because these drugs don't come without consequence. We are providing these opioids to individuals. We need to monitor them. There's not just a cost to that, but over time, there may be issues about respiratory drive suppression, constipation, all the other side effects. So it's real, and it's a risk-benefit ratio that we deal with in, this, in the treatment of hypertension, diabetes, and any other disease. Thank you very much for the question. Okay, please join me in thanking Dr. Tress for the <laughs>